as well uh, many times with, uh, with Dr. Bingham. So uh, with that, the title of the topic today is A Modern Legacy of Tertullian and Lactantius on Religious Liberty. That, uh, Good morning, and a thank you to Dr. Presley uh, and the Center for Early Christian Studies in allowing me to be a visiting scholar over the winter term, as he mentioned, researching this topic, and also uh, to Dr. Craig Kubik of Roberts Library for helping to arrange that. Probably also fitting that I would uh, thank my own dean back home, uh, Dr. Ken Rathbun and Pastor Wayne Hart, for writing some letters of recommendation for that to happen as well. Um, I am from the Midwest, and so um, when I flew in yesterday that seemed like there's still some weeping and wailing over a football game uh, from Sunday. And so I do apologize uh, for that. <laughs> but we, uh, we made it through an ice storm, an Iowa ice storm to get here, although I did come down with a head cold on the way down. So I'll try to do my best to speak clearly. As I mentioned, this is the modern legacy of Tertullian and Lactantius on religious liberty. One could say the flame of religious liberty, the role of early Baptists in passing on a patristic torch. The topic of religious liberty has not only seeped back into political debate, it has inundated public discourse. Many people assume that the notion of religious liberty is a product of the Enlightenment, not realizing that both term and concept have a more time-honored pedigree. The term libertas religionis, religious liberty, was first advanced by Tertullian of Carthage, a Christian apologist who flourished in the early 200s. Lactantius, who helped the stance who helped shape the stance enunciated by the Edict of Milan, adopted and advanced the notion. This patristic spark of religious liberty was fueled during the Reformation era, was rekindled by the early Baptists, and then burst into flames during America's founding. This article will highlight some fascinating episodes in the passing of this patristic torch, including the role of the early English Baptists. So we'll begin with Tertullian. <clears throat> Tertullian, a North African theologian and Christian apologist, believed that freedom of religion fits the inherent nature of belief. True belief cannot be coerced. The nature of humans, any worship that does not come from the heart, is hypocritical. And the nature of God, a worthy God, would not commend forced worship. This is a robust concept of religious liberty that is more comprehensive than mere religious toleration. In his Apology 28, Tertullian contended that authorities should not do away with freedom of religion, or libertatum religionis, to forbid a man choice of deity so that I may not worship whom I would, but am forced to worship whom I would not. He argued that no worthy deity would wish to receive reluctant worship. By analogy, not even a human would desire to receive unwilling homage. And these come from Apology 24. In the context of defending jus libertatis, or the right of liberty, Tertullian explained, moreover, the injustice of forcing men of free will to offer a sacrifice against their will is readily apparent, for under all other circumstances, a willing mind is required for discharging one's religious obligations. It certainly would be considered absurd were one man compelled by another to honor gods whom he ought to honor if of his own accord and for his own sake. Apology 28. In a work addressed to a persecuting Roman procurator named Scapula, Tertullian declared, it is the law of humanity and the natural right of each individual, or humani juris et naturalis potestatis est iniquiqua, to worship what he thinks proper, nor does the religion of one man either harm or help another. But it is not proper for religion to compel men to religion, which should be accepted of one's own accord, not by force, since sacrifices also are required of a willing mind. So even if you compel us to sacrifice, you will render no service to your gods, at scapulum two. So that was uh, the case of Tertullian. and this brings us to Lactantius and the Edict of Milan. <clears throat> Lactantius, another North African Christian author, had been a teacher of rhetoric prior to his conversion. Having witnessed the Diocletian persecution of Christians, Lactantius insisted that religion is a matter which is voluntary above all others, nor can necessity be imposed upon any so as to worship that which he does not wish, the epitome 54. Although individuals can be forced to pretend falsely that they are worshiping, the true desire remains lacking. Targeting the abuse of power, Lactantius queried, who is so indolent, so lofty, as to forbid me to raise my eyes to heaven, to impose on me the necessity either of worshiping what I do not want, 
or of not worshiping what I wish. Divine Institutes 513. He asserted that worship against one's will, worship that is without devotion and faith, is useless to God. There is no need of force and injury because religion cannot be forced. It is a matter that must be managed by words rather than by blows so that it may be voluntary. Quote, if you wish indeed to defend religion by blood, if by torments, if by evil, then it will not be defended, but it will be polluted and violated. There is nothing so voluntary as religion, and if the mind of the one sacrificing is the religious right is turned aside, the act is now removed, there is no act of religion. Divine Institutes 519. Lactantius contrasted worship that entailed the entire soul and a ritualistic act which only pertains to the fingers. According to Lactantius, when faithless persons are forced to worship and sacrifice, they offer nothing intimate, nothing personal to their gods. They have no uprightness of mind, no reverence, no fear. Divine Institutes 519. A sacrifice which is wrested from one against his will is meaningless, since worship that is not spontaneous and from the heart is an execration, as when men do it driven by proscription or injuries or prison or term torments. 519 again. After the cessation of persecution, Lactantius served as Constantine's advisor, and his influence is reflected in the imperial proclamation of the Edict of Milan, AD 312. The edict promised Christians free and unrestricted opportunity to practice their religion, but it also guaranteed all residents the freedom of religion in accordance with sound and upright reason. Quote, to others as well, the freedom and full liberty has been granted in accordance with the peace of our times, to exercise free choice in worshiping as each one has seen fit, end quote. Christianity, which had endured the Decian and Diocletian persecutions, as well as local and sporadic oppressions, had finally attained freedom of worship alongside other religions. Unfortunately, after the unfolding of the so-called Constantinian turn, the persecuted became the persecutors. By the end of the fourth century, emperors, and other authorities were repressing Jews, pagans, and heretics in the name of Christianity. The balance of religious freedom had been lost. This brings us to Sebastian Castellio. The flickering cinders of Libertas Religionis would be reignited in the 16th and 17th centuries, and they would be ablaze by the 18th century. This is, of course, not to say that it was not discussed at all in the Middle Ages. Sebastian Castellio and the Anabaptists supported religious liberty on the continent. The early English Baptists staunchly promoted the notion, and the American founding fathers embraced it. Lactantius' arguments reappear in the Reformation-era work of Sebastian Castellio. In October 1553, Michael Servetus was executed in Geneva, Switzerland, on charges of blasphemy and heresy. Servetus, a physician by trade, had denied the doctrine of the Trinity, Although many Protestant leaders agreed with how the execution unfolded in Calvin's Geneva, a few balked. Castellio, a professor of Greek at the University of Basel, was morally outraged. He opposed the use of capital punishment to enforce religious persuasion on principle, and the execution of Servetus plunged him into a lifelong con uh, controversy. In February of 1554, Calvin composed Defense of the Orthodox Faith, a work defending not only the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, but also the Genevan execution of Servetus. Shortly thereafter, Castellio, using a pen name, published Should Heretics Be Persecuted, 1554, as a defense of religious toleration. In support of his views, Castellio invoked the words of past luminaries, including lengthy passages from Lactantius. Theodore Beza, a disciple of Calvin, joined the fray by writing a spirited response entitled On the Punishment of Heretics by the Civil Magistrate, 1554, and Castellio, using another gnome diploma, countered with On the Non-Punishment of Heretics by the Civil Magistrate, 1555. In his treatise against Calvin's book, Castellio directly charged Calvin, arguing that he should not have sent Servetus to the magistrate to be cast out and killed. He contended, quote, to kill a man is not to defend a doctrine, but to kill a man. When the Genevans killed Servetus, they did not defend a doctrine, they killed a man, end quote. Castellio reasoned that because Servetus did not take up arms, but argumentation, he should have been resisted with the same. 
Castellio died in 1563, and he was buried in the tomb of an illustrious family. Opponents exhumed his body, burned it, and scattered the ashes. Some of his followers, however, erected a monument in memoriam. Through his writings, Castellio's ideas lived on and influenced various Dutch authors. Peter Jans Twisk, the Dutch Anabaptist author, followed Castellio's lead by publishing a compilation of over 1,000 historical sources supporting religious toleration, including patristic materials. Eventually, such tributaries of toleration flowed into the currents of religious liberty enjoyed throughout the West, as embodied in the founding of the United States of America. So we come to the American founding fathers. In an academic conference presentation in 2006, I hypothesized that the patristic concept of religious liberty, as found in Tertullian and Lactantius, may have influenced the American founding fathers, including James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. I summoned the fascinating evidence of the catalog of Thomas Jefferson's personal library. Under the subject of title of religion, Jefferson's catalog, which was enumerated by shelf position, lists number 31, Tertullianus, number 32, Lactantius, number 33, Lactantius on the death of persecutors. At the time, I commented, quote, of course, we cannot know for sure that erudite Jefferson, no adherent of Orthodox Christianity himself, ever read these specific books in his library, much less if they directly impacted his views on religious liberty, end quote. The paper concluded that this was an intriguing and tantalizing, yet unverifiable possibility. Through an interesting series of events, however, this supposedly unverifiable possibility has indeed been verified. Now we actually know for sure that the early church fathers influenced the American founding fathers. As my resultant article was finally impressed during the autumn of 2012, I attended a public lecture presented by Robert Lewis Wilkin, the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of the History of Christianity at the University of Virginia. Wilkins' historical research was developed more fully and later published as The Christian Roots of Religious Freedom, 2014. The epilogue of his volume relates a fascinating discovery. Wilkin found the Latin of Tertullian's Ad Scapulum II written out in Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, 1781, in the Special Collections Library of the University of Virginia. Based upon this evidence, Wilkin requested access to Jefferson's personal copy of Tertullian's works at the Library of Congress. There he discovered that Jefferson had underlined the relevant passage on religious freedom in Ad Scapulum, and he had placed an X in the margin. This discovery constituted proof positive of my earlier hypothesis that the Church Fathers influenced the American Founding Fathers in the matter of freedom of religion. I would add that Madison's list of recommended theology books, <clears throat> as found in a letter to Jefferson dated September 10, 1824, included both a 1746 edition of Tertullian and a 1740 edition of Lactantius. Furthermore, the Jefferson Adams correspondence further evidences knowledge of material in both Tertullian and Lactantius, although not directly tied to the topic of religious liberty. This brings us to Roger Williams and William Penn. Robert Wilkin argues that Thomas Jefferson was not reading through Tertullian's Ad Scapulum when he underlined and marked the relevant material in chapter two. Quote, it is most unlikely he spent winter evenings at Monticello reading the church fathers, end quote. More, more likely, argues Wilkin, Jefferson was deliberately looking for the specific Tertullianic text highlighted by Roger Williams. This may indeed be the case, as both William Penn and Roger Williams had borrowed from Tertullian. We'll begin with William Penn. William Penn, the Quaker leader and founder of Pennsylvania, championed historic principles of religious freedom. They reflected upon the sense and practice of the wisest, greatest, and best states and persons of ancient and modern times, states Penn. He quoted Lactantius in support, quote, If you will, with blood, with evil, and with torments defend your worship, it shall not thereby be defended, but polluted, end quote. Penn borrowed from Tertullian as well in both his Great Case of Liberty of Conscience, 1670, 
and his a persuasive to moderation to church dissenters, <clears throat> excuse me, 1686, Penn cited a paraphrased passage from Tertullian's Ad Scapulum II, quote, that tis not the property of religion to compel or persecute for religion. She should be accepted for herself, not for force, end quote. Jefferson's own words in his notes on the state of Virginia, however, apparently reflect a different sentence from the same chapter in Tertullian's At Scapulum. This other sentence had been quoted three times in Roger Williams's The Bloody Tenet of Persecution, 1644. Quote, another man's religion <coughs> neither hurteth, <coughs> excuse me, neither hurteth nor profiteth any. End quote. Thomas Jefferson memorably rewarded Tertullian's sentiment as cited in Williams by evocatively drawing out its implications. Quote, but it does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are twenty gods or no god. It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. End quote. Notes in the state of Virginia query. 18. Wilkin argues that this, this quotation in Williams likely motivated Jefferson to look up the original passage in Tertullian. Williams's The Bloody Tenet of Persecution argued that a false religion would not cause hurt in two instances. First, when the false religion is outside the church, it does not hurt the church, no more, no more than weeds in the wilderness hurt the enclosed garden. Chapter 70. Second, a false religion will not hurt the civil state if the errantists break no civil law, chapter 70. Within this argumentation against the Puritan authorities of Massachusetts Bay Colony, Williams quoted Tertullian. Williams went on to found the colony of Rhode Island and for a time supported the formation of the First Baptist Church of America located in Providence. At least what I think most historians think is the First Baptist Church in America. John Cotton, Williams' Puritan interlocutor in the matter, vigorously responded in his The Bloody Tenet Washed Clean, 1647. He retained the opinion that Tertullian's, quote, intent, faith be, is only to restrain Scapula, the Roman governor of Africa, from persecuting the Christians, not for offering sacrifice to their heathen gods, chapter 67. Cotton refused to acknowledge a principled, fuller understanding of religious freedom in Tertullian's Ad Scapulum. Cotton argued that Tertullian's position, quote, must be understood of private worship or of religion professed in private, chapter 67. As a Puritan leader in New England, Cotton attempted to apply religious toleration to private belief but not to public expression, a limited understanding of religious liberty. This then brings us to the early English Baptists. <clears throat> to fill in the gap between Castellio and the New World, Wilkin also discusses how Roger Williams's quotation of Tertullian followed the example of the English Baptist author John Merton. Merton's humble application argued that persecution for cause of conscience is condemned by the ancient and later writers, yea, by Puritans and Papists. As proof from antiquity, Merton quoted a lengthy passage from Tertullian, Ad Scapulum II, encompassing Williams's citation. Quote, it agreeth both with human equity and natural reason that every man worship God uncompelled and believe what he will. For another man's religion or belief neither hurteth nor profiteth any man, neither beseemeth it any religion to compel another to be of the religion which willingly and freely should be embraced and not by constraint for as much as the offerings were required of those that freely and with a good will offered and not from the contrary, end quote. So a very lengthy passage from Tertullian. Thus far where Wilkin leads us. Yet other episodes of the passing of the Tertullianic torch and Lactantian light of Libertas religionis remain to be told. In early modernity, Tertullian and Lactantius had seemingly become the coin of the realm when it came to debates concerning the historical roots of religious freedom. The laying out of the full evidence for this claim must await another occasion, but I summon a few more witnesses to the stand beyond those held in the dock by Wilkin. I will simply focus upon the role play by other early English separatist and Baptist works which remain unmentioned by Wilkin in relaying the patristic ideas. <clears throat> 
In July of 1656, John Sturgeon and other English Baptists composed a letter complaining of Oliver Cromwell as that loathsome hypocrite. In 1657, Sturgeon was thrown in the Tower of London, where he remained until February of 1659, even though Cromwell passed away on September 3, 1658. Sturgeon's A Plea for Toleration of Opinions and Persuasions in Matter of Religion, 1661, borrowed from the work of Jeremy Taylor by citing a list of patristic proponents of religious toleration, including both Tertullian and Lactantius. Samuel Richardson, the English Baptist author of The Necessity of Toleration in Matters of Religion, 1647, posed the question, quote, whether it be, sorry, whether it be not a natural law for every man that liveth to worship that that which he thinketh is God, and as he thinketh he ought to worship, and to force otherwise will be concluded an oppression of those per persons so forced. Quote. The material, especially the first half, seemingly reflects a paraphrase of Tertullian's Ad Scapulum II. Richardson condenses Tertullian's reference to the law of mankind and the natural right of each individual into a natural law. Most likely, Richardson incorporated the Tertullianic echo secondhand and adapted it for his own purposes. Richardson's work was also, also cited the decree of Constantine and Licinius in full, that is, the Edict of Milan, which we have noted was probably influenced by Lactantius. A contemporary of Henry Burton, I'm sorry, a contemporary, Henry Burton, <laughs> wrote an introduction to religious peace or a plea for liberty of conscience by Leonard Busher. 1614 was when Busher's work was published. Busher had spent time in Amsterdam, was acquainted with John Robinson and probably John Smith, and became a member of Thomas Hellwes's Baptist congregation upon return to England. Burton's preface to Busher's work properly declared, quote, the plea for liberty of conscience is no new doctrine, end quote. In this case, an introduction by 17th century Puritan, Burton, Prefacing a work on religious freedom by an early Baptist, Busher, acknowledged the long pedigree of religious liberty. And as a side note, it should be noted that Burton's ears were cut off for attacking the religious views of William Laud, the anti-Puritan Archbishop of Canterbury. Freedom of religion requires eternal vigilance. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This brings us to Hercules Collins was an English Baptist leader and the author of the Orthodox Catechism, a Baptistic adaptation of the Heidelberg Catechism. Collins's Some Reasons for Separation from the Communion of the Church of England maintained, quote, that none should be compelled to worship God by a temporal sword, but such as come willingly, and none can worship God to acceptance but such, end quote. Collins referenced Hillary's Against Auxentius and quoted a lengthy passage from Tertullian's Ad Scapulum II. Steve Weaver notes, quote, the use of these patristic references found in Merton and Williams likely indicates a familiarity by Collins with two of the most important early Baptist works of religious liberty, end quote. Weaver also notes, quote, the quotation from Tertullian, though reproduced in its entirety, is attributed merely to one of the ancients. This method of citation parallels that found in other 17th century materials, including those of John Robinson. <clears throat> John Robinson, the English separatist who organized the Mayflower voyage of the Pilgrims, had also been influenced by Peter Twisk, as had Merton and Busher. Remember, Twisk was the Dutch Anabaptist. Robinson pointed out that authors are usually for or against religious toleration based upon their own social standing, whether entitlement or exclusion. Alluding to the works of both Tertullian and Lactantius, cited indirectly as, quote, the ancient fathers, and Robinson's New Essays, Observations, Divine and Moral, 1625, affirmed, quote, and here's another long quote, the very same is to be observed in the ancient fathers in their times, of whom such as lived in the first 300 years after Christ and suffered with the churches under heathen persecutors, pledged against all violence for religion, true or false, affirming that it is of human right and natural liberty for every man to worship what he thinketh God, and that it is no property of religion which ought to be taken up freely, that no man is forced by the Christians against his will, seeing he that wants faith and devotion is unserviceable to God, and that God, not being contentious, would not be worshipped of the unwilling, whereas, on the contrary, the latter, 
having the emperor's Christian on their side incited and pressed them to violent courses. End quote. Robinson declared that persecutors are to be pitied since they damage their own consciences before the Lord. Without using Tertullian's name directly, but only the label of the ancient father, singular, Robinson declared that the ancient father desired scapula that he would pity himself if he would not pity the Christians whom he cruelly persecuted, seeing the most hurt came to himself thereby. So although Tertullian's name is not used, the ancient father who addressed scapula clearly is Tertullian. Of course, Robinson had a previous falling out with the early Baptists concerning their understanding of full religious freedom, among other issues. John Smith maintained, quote, that the magistrate is not by virtue of his office to meddle with religion or matters of conscience to force and compel men to this or that form of religion or doctrine, but leave Christian religion free to every man's conscience and to handle only civil transgressions, end quote. Robinson responded, quote, it is true they, that is the magistrates, have no power against the laws, doctrines, and religion of Christ, but for the same, if their power be of God, they may use it lawfully and against the contrary, end quote. The Baptist author of Persecution for Religion Judged and Condemned, 1615, opposed, opposed this concessive stance, as did Leonard Busher. The latter was disappointed that Robinson did not engage in a back-and-forth disputation. Walter Burgess explains, quote, Robinson did not think it worthwhile to reply. He was probably too busy or felt that a sufficient answer would be found in the tracts he was about to issue. Busher was rather nettled at his silence. So that's kind of the, the historical overview. I'm going to close with some insights uh, tied into some modern scholarship. These final materials from early English Baptist history may nuance the recent, and I would say wonderfully thought-provoking, works of Jason Witt. Witt is certainly right that the early English Baptists did not espouse the autonomous nature of the individual. When they spoke of human rights, they were tapping into a theological anthropology. Human agency is always bounded by God, in whom we live and move and have our being. Would also suitably contrast some modern notions of individualism, maintaining that the early English Baptists emphasized both a disciplined and a disciplining community. Would explains, quote, they never sought to uncouple people from one another, as if an individual's faith could exist apart from life in community with other believers, end quote. He adds, quote, true freedom is found in a community that recognizes its submission to the authority of Christ, a community where individual members can express their faith only as they remain bound to one another in Christ, end quote. In another article, Wood explains that the early Baptists viewed individuals as, quote, both the producers and products of formative communities. Quit concludes, quote, thus, for Baptists, religious liberty is not an anthropocentric concern with rights, but a theocentric emphasis on God's sovereignty, end quote. He goes a step further, however, by contrasting between an emphasis upon divine freedom, as found within the English Baptists, and an emphasis upon individual human freedom or individual rights, as found in the American Baptists. According to Witt, the culprit who launched this emphasis upon individual human rights as taken over by the later Baptists was John Locke. Quote, Locke shifts the theocentric basis for religious liberty to be anthropocentric, a freedom rooted in individual human right. End quote. Herein lies an apparent, perhaps oversimplification of the history of religious liberty. The early English Baptists were situated within a prolonged conversation on religious liberty that already used similar language of individual or human rights, yet framed by a robust theology. Tertullian had already referenced the law of humanity and the natural right of each individual, humani iuris et naturalis potestatis est uniquiqua, in his Ad Scapulum II. And he had mentioned the right of liberty, iure libertatis, in his Apology 28. As Lactantius declared, religious oppression is against the law of humanity, contra jus humanitatis, and against all divine justice, contra fas omne. Although one should not anachronistically import modern developed concepts of human rights into Tertullian and Lactantius, the inchoate, the inchoate impulse was there. While Witt starts with the English Baptists and moves forward, the English separatists and early Baptists recognized the ancient sources championing the natural right of religious liberty, 
John Robinson acknowledged that patristic sources spoke of religious liberty as being, quote, of human right and natural liberty, end quote, and therefore no one should be forced against his will. Merton had directly quoted Tertullian's Ad Scapulum II, quote, it agrees both with human equity and natural reason that every man worship God and compelled and believe what he will. And Richardson, by adapting Tertullianic material, similarly spoke of, quote, a natural law for every man, end quote. As a further complication, Whit insists any notion of freedom that isolates and internalizes faith is simply contrary to the freedom envisioned by the Baptists who first issued calls for religious liberty. However, this conflation of internalizes with isolates could also be misleading, as faith forms and sustain in a disciplined community can and should be internalized. That is, faith can be internalized without being isolated. Witt's opposition to the privatization of faith, and the privatization of belief is more helpful than his opposition to the internalization of faith. Unfortunately, Witt manifests a tendency to conflate the two in his critique of faith as a, quote, private internal affair, End quote. To oppose the construal of private internal faith is to oppose a mosaic of the good and bad. For the early English Baptists, faith was definitely internal, but also communally informed and communally, communally engaged. The English Baptist treatises on freedom of conscience frequently and positively highlighted internal heart belief. One example may suffice. Quote, for if by threatening me with punishment, as imprisonment, banishment, or death, you cause me to bring my body and not my spirit or soul, so shall I come near to the Lord with my lips, when my heart shall be far from him, which he accounteth vain worship and hypocrisy. End quote. This was not a new sentiment. Lactantius had already made the same basic argument that internal belief cannot be externally coerced. Unless worship is spontaneous and from the heart, it is an execration. Divine Institutes 520. Charles Freeman summarizes Lactantius' perspective, quote, belief imposed from outside is meaningless to God who places greater value on conviction from within, end quote. What contrasts a theocentric understanding of religious liberty centered upon a, a con quote, concern for God's activity and, quote, God's design for salvation with an anthropocentric understanding of religious liberty that emphasizes individual human freedom? He states, quote, the early English Baptists were not primarily concerned with individual human freedom, but with divine freedom, end quote. One appreciates the guarded qualification represented by the insertion of primarily, a difference of degree rather than kind. Yet even the qualified framework rests upon a constructed dichotomy that remains potentially misleading. First, Witt's twice-repeated statement that the early Baptists were motivated by, quote, a concern for God's sovereignty, end quote, is somewhat peculiar, implying a concern that divine sovereignty might be jeopardized in some manner by human activity, a theological impossibility. Second, the concern for God's activity and God's design for, for salvation, on the one hand, and the concern for individual human freedom and the violation of the individual's freedom, on the other hand, are not competitors, they are companions. According to the early Baptists, God's soteriological design included the internally willed rather than externally coerced nature of saving faith. A coerced belief is not true belief. Coercing humans is not appropriately, appropriately treating them as truly human. A supposed deity who desires coerced belief falls short of the true God. And I have a footnote here that may be helpful to make sure we're on the same page. One should emphasize that the discussion regards freedom from the state coercion of faith, not matters of God's sovereignty and human freedom as represented by, by Calvinist Arminian debates. Helwes, Merton, Busher, and Sturgeon were all general Baptists, as was Williams when he associated with the Baptists. Samuel Richardson and Hercules Collins were particular Baptists. The early English Baptists consensually opposed the magistrate's wrongful presumption of the divine role in saving sinners, even if they construed that divine role differently. Calvinists and Arminians could agree that true faith is an internally willed faith, not a politically coerced faith. Calvinists would add that God must efficaciously call the radically depraved sinner in order to cause such internal willing. They would highlight such texts as, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, Acts 16, 14. So that's what I mean by internally willed versus externally coerced or politically coerced. 
Tertullian and Lactantius had already argued that libertas religionis corresponded both to the inherent nature of humans and to the essential nature of God. The two sentiments inherently work in essential harmony. Which brings us to our conclusion. Religious toleration and religious liberty are the cries of the underdog, the plea of the oppressed minority. Religious liberty is a fuller concept than religious toleration. While toleration implies mere human allowance, early Baptists emphasize a religious liberty founded in God's desires for humans made in his image. This religious liberty encompassed both freedom of conscience and the free exercise of religion. Religious liberty is not a mantra to be bandied about, nor a political contrivance to score rhetorical points. It is an inalienable right intended for all humanity by a sovereign God, and it ensures the voluntary nature of religious belief. God has chosen to relate with humans to reflect the imago dei through the direct interaction indicated by voluntary religion. This was the point famously underscored by the Danbury Baptists in their correspondence with Thomas Jefferson concerning the First Amendment of the American Bill of Rights. These Connecticut Baptists insisted religion is at all times and places a matter between God and individuals. Religious liberty is not a privilege granted by government, but an inalienable right granted by God, and government is tasked not with giving it, but with guarding it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, open up the floor. I must say that my, my primary field of, of uh, research is not early English Baptist, so I may have be happy to hear any good critiques of the 1600s material, since even for me, like Tansy's is late for me, my primary focus is second century, actually. <clears throat> Yes. Roger Williams and Roger Williams. Yes. I didn't hear much about William Penn. William Penn does quote the patristic uh, sources um, in two of his works, and let's see here. Sure. So of course, William Penn, the Quaker founder of Pennsylvania, quoted. Uh, like Tantius, in his great case of liberty of conscience and a persuasive to moderation of church dissenters, two different works, and Penn cited a paraphrased passage from Tertullian's Ad Scapulum II. Um, however, that, that part he uses is not the part Jefferson paraphrases, which is why Wilkin would say it's more likely that Jefferson's tapping into Williams, Roger Williams, rather than Williams. Sure, to the best of my ability, and I'd love to get feedback on this. So it's working a couple of ways. Um, Whit is arguing that the English Baptists were concerned with divine freedom. American Baptists, because they're influenced by Locke, start talking more and emphasizing individual human rights and natural rights. So what I was doing at that point is critiquing that because Whit begins, the 1600s and moves forward, that the language of individual human rights and human rights, though, is actually uh, predecessing the English Baptists, of course, by centuries. It's going way back to Latantis and Tertullian. Having said that, they're still definitely within, within very much of a theological anthropology framework. So uh, what does Locke cause as far as trajectories? And here's where my knowledge would be uh, much more shady. Um, Locke does not quote Latantis and Tertullian. And, um, he may well have known of their work. It may have been purposeful that he does not quote it. And he definitely puts it more into kind of a history of political and philosophical history. And is it possible that some, such as Bacchus and, and Leland, pick up that from Locke and move it further along? And I would be very open to that. I'm not saying there's no differences between the English and the later American Baptist leaders. 
um, but that one doesn't want to oversimplify or overstate the case because uh, long prior to Locke, there was that very specific language in Latin, uh, the natural right of freedom or the right of liberty, uh, although clearly it's still a theological framework. Is that is that helpful somewhat? That, that is helpful. Would you paint for me what uh, divine freedom that uh, what, what means by that? human freedom looks like? Well, first of all, what Witt meant in the contrast was that the uh, secular authorities don't presume God's prerogative in forming faith in people. So that, that's what he means by their concern for divine sovereignty, that they don't presume upon God's role in the formation of faith. Otherwise, um, what I was trying to do in this case is, you know, really a history of religious liberty I was trying to paint a broad ocean on which an ocean of divine freedom in which human freedom is going to float that on any view, you know, as my quote from Max would say, in him we live and move and have our being. What that um, looks like is going to depend upon their Calvinistic Arminian type uh, proclivities in that spectrum. But that's not what Witt's getting at because Witt is actually arguing the general Baptists um, in their view. In fact, even you know, has quotations how Christ died for everyone so we should share uh, Christ with everyone, and the political ruler should not take that prerogative. So he's, he's not trying to get into Calvinistic Arminian type debates of divine freedom, human freedom. Is that helpful? Okay. Yes? Um, would you make the argument that what um, are originally being argued by these two church fathers um, Subsequently, um, and, you, and you subsequently see, uh, I guess, uh, is it is a polemical issue of its day that is subsequently maybe resolved in, with, during the imperial church era, and you don't really see the issue come back up until um, the, the Protestant Reformation. But when these two, um, or when the issue of religious freedom kind of pops back up again in the Protestant Reformation. Um, uh, Tertullian, uh, Tertullian and Lactantius um, are pulled, and would you say that they're used by these two groups, the, uh, the early Baptists, and, or the English Baptists and the American Baptists, would you say that they're pulled out of their original context for the sake of making points? Sure. A lot in that paragraph, a lot of good stuff in that paragraph. Let me just tackle a couple of those. First of all, going back to Tertullian like Tantius, I like your word polemical. Because clearly, they're, uh, especially Tertullian is in the midst of at least the possibility of the outbreak of, uh, of some type of authorities, oppression. Uh, I think we all realize that there's not constant persecution of Christian in the Roman Empire. It's local, sporadic outbreaks primarily, apart from the DC and Diocletian persecutions. And so in that context, he's polemically arguing for this very robust form of religious liberty. Um, is there the chance that part of it is pro forma, meaning that uh, Roland Baton you know, has another quote from Tertullian that the 1600s people don't quote that seems to imply the possibility of persecuting heretics, for example. Um, so Baton uh, deals with that quotation from Tertullian in his book on Sebastian and Castellio. And of course, like Tancius, you're in the middle of, of the turn. Um, like like Tancius' life, at least, is in the middle of that Constantinian turn. So I, I do think that the sense of how uh, people are more prone to talk about religious liberty when they see themselves on the excluded side rather than on the powerful side is very true. And that may even help um, think our way through even modern discourse, like you know, some people uh, have a sense suddenly of I mean, persecution is a way overstated word, but some type of social marginalization, let's say. So suddenly the, the language is back, and it's a reminder that we all, if we really believe this on principle, should have a principled version of religious liberty that is true, whether or not currently our brand of religiosity is the one that's being marginalized more than others. So 
And then the last part of your question was, yes, they tend to simply take out um, little snippets about religious liberty. In fact, it gets even worse than that in the sense that it would seem like the early Baptists are simply taking it from um, lists already put together by people like Twisk and Castillo of like just all these quotes side by side. So, for example, you'll have like Augustine quotes in there that could be taken as you know, uncoerced freedom, etc. But we all know that Augustine's own views of coercion and the heretics is much more complicated than simply pulling out a phrase as if he's supporting in a modern sense a modern religious liberty. The other thing to add to your question would be I made a pretty large jump from like Tansius to Castellio, and I'm not at all a medievalist. Wilkin does bring out a couple of examples of this discussion, not so much quoting Tertullian like Tansius. One that comes to mind would be Gregory the Great talks about not having coerced baptism, for example. Um, but we all know that the Middle Ages, of course, is, is complex on the issues of uh, religious freedom. So does that <coughs> help somewhat? I, I, I do think they're being more text-based, in that sense, ah, historical, taking out nice quotes that fit really well. But if you if you take Tertullian like Tanzania at face level, it's really robust. It's it's religious liberty, uh, not simply religious toleration. The question is though, is that because they themselves, at least Tertullian, was facing the possibility of persecution? Now, you said you're not a medievalist, but do right. you know if uh, Tertullian and like Tanzania used by some of the medieval splinter groups like the Waldensians mm. or any of these groups? I do not know that for sure. And I know a lot of those groups we don't have much primary source material from, per se, uh, when you get into the Honritians and Paulicians and people like that. But maybe someone else in the room might know more about that. But, but you know, the nonconformists of the Middle Ages. I'm, I'm not familiar with any direct quotation. Other questions? Um, my question was, um, as you're reading, especially the early church fathers, um, was there any sense that this idea of re religious liberty was curbed by their ideas of that law? Um, I'm thinking, like, when we hear the statements that they make, sometimes they're understood within this entire framework of, of, of God's um, all-controlling power and things like this, whereas we would assume um, maybe a, a greater extent of religious liberty. Uh, your first sentence, maybe it's because of my cold, I missed if they had a greater understanding of, you say natural law or the law? Yeah, like, let's say natural okay. law. So, I mean, like, okay, they, they're, they're going to allow people to practice religious freedom up until a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, two things. <clears throat> so I think it's Zagor, and there's some others in my footnotes who have kind of like a trace of Western ideas of religious freedom, not just Christian. And Cicero does have, under the, under the rubric of natural law, seems to have some types of statements that could incline one toward a trajectory of religious liberty. It's you know nothing nearly like what we think of in a modern political sense. Um, and then I had a second thing I was going to mention based upon your question here. Um, oh, so when you get to Locke, I think you have other facets. Um, some would argue like Hugo Grotius's or Grotius's kind of more political flavor. So it's kind of getting divorced from the theological side. And so, yeah, I think there are some differences. And that's why I don't want to anachronistically read individual human rights and natural rights into Tertullian Lactantius, even though they do have that rather robust language about it. So I think there's just lots of streams that are pouring in. So, yes? I just wanted you to just define the uh, influence on Correct. I think it's probably more like that. Those last couple of sentences are saying it's almost like window dressing. Although 
It's not simply ornamental, though. I think they do prove the point for them that this is ancient, that it's not simply brand new. But the use of this kind of grabbing quotes, though, is rather window dressing like. It's rather ornamental. I'm not trying to argue that they are the ground or foundation of their view of religious liberty. Uh, but it does show that this is not a new topic of conversation. It, it's a long, prolonged topic of conversation. Um, then beyond that, this would be outside of my purview as well. I, you know, the question of so Thomas Jefferson definitely read Tertullian. I think that's interesting. It's fascinating. I'm not trying to argue that's his primary source for that. Uh, the, the, the middle term, the lock, the Lockean term. I think then you have to answer how Christianized is Locke. And that's not my feel. My, my read of Witt and Wilkin would be that Wilkin thinks he's rather Christianized. Actually, says some statements to that effect, while Witt would tend to paint him more as, I'm not trying to say like a, a New Testament Christian, it's Christianized in a Christendom sense. You know, how, how Christianized is he? Um, and I think Witt would paint him as much less so. Regardless of that debate, one can't overstate the case as if the language of natural rights and individual human rights arises and launched with Locke and enters into the American English situation. Does that help some? 